afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me here today. Um, I guess since I've had the good fortune to, uh, to go last, um, I'm going to build a lot on uh, my colleagues' presentations. I'm going to begin today by providing a short overview of FinTrack. Um, I'm sure most of you don't really have a good idea of, of exactly what we do and, and, and the role we play um, in Canada's AML um, and CTF regime. I'm going to speak um, to FinTrack's role as Canada's financial intelligence unit, as well as its interest in innovative financial technologies. I'll then build on Gabriel's presentation by speaking to you more about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular. This will include an overview of the vulnerabilities of these technologies to abuse for money laundering and terrorist financing purposes, and how they are typically laundered. So what is FinTrack? FinTrack is Canada's financial intelligence unit. It was created in the year 2000 under the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act, PCMLTFA, or the Act. The centre reports directly to the Minister of Finance, with the Department of Finance serving as the Canadian AML, CTF regime and policy lead. So thanks, Gabe, for uh, your excellent overview of the policy landscape as it currently, currently pertains to virtual currencies in Canada. Vintrack's ma mandate is to contribute to the safety of Canadians and to protect the integrity of the Canadian financial system through the detection, prevention, and deterrence of money laundering and terrorist financing. For those of you who may not know, the act of money laundering aims to disguise the criminal source of funds by making them appear clean or legitimate. Following a predicate offense, money laundering is typically conducted in three stages, placement, layering, and integration. Alternatively, terrorist financing refers to the act of using funds, property, or services to encourage, plan, assist, or engage in acts of terrorism. As opposed to money laundering, the sources of funds used for terrorist financing can be both legally or illegally obtained. The common thread between these two acts is the obfuscation of the source or destination of funds, which is often associated with the obfuscation of the identity of the individuals associated with the transaction trail. FinTrack fulfills two key operational functions in carrying out its mandate. First, the centre is responsible for administering the PCML TFA regulations by ensuring that each Canadian business that falls under any of the reporting entity sectors outlined in the Act comply with their obligations. This includes ensuring that any business that engages with the Canadian financial sector and is identified in the Act adequately identifies their clients, monitors business relationships, keeps records and, report, and reports certain types of financial transactions to the centre. This robust compliance program ensures that we receive more than 20 million transaction reports each year. Under a compliance for intelligence model, these reports allow our analysts to produce actionable financial intelligence to help Canadian police, law enforcement and national security partners to combat money laundering, terrorist financing and other threats to the security of Canada. Careful analysis of this information in conjunction with open source and other information also allows the centre to develop strategic products and intelligence to better understand emerging trends, patterns and typologies of money laundering and terrorist financing activities in Canada, Canada and abroad. This work is essential to policy and decision makers, international partners and other stakeholders in their efforts to bolster the Canadian anti-money laundering counter-terrorist financing regimes in the face of emerging threats. In an increasingly digital world, these strategic activities also include the development of expertise in innovative financial technology trends and developments relevant to money laundering and terrorist financing. This includes working to understand how technological developments can challenge both FinTrack's compliance and intelligence arms, or otherwise impact its ability to fulfill its mandate. Recent innovations in financial technology have resulted in a, a targeted strategic approach undertaken by the Centre to better understand these developments. While the concept of financial technology, or FinTech, is not new, we've seen increased interest, investment and innovation in these technologies over recent years. Much of this innovation has been driven by a proliferation of new players offering technologically enabled financial services. This includes both tech giants such as Apple, Facebook and Google, as well as th thousands of agile fintech startups and countless private developers that have entered the financial marketplace to compete with traditional financial institutions or otherwise offer financial so solutions that are parallel to the regulated financial sector. What this means from the financial intelligence or the FIU perspective is that we are currently operating in an environment that is increasingly diverse and occupied, with, occupied sorry, with financial providers and consumers that we have not historically interacted with 
and that the traditional money laundering model of placement, layering, and integration may be challenged by new technologies. Understanding how innovations in financial service delivery will impact the Canadian anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing regime has required a very comprehensive approach. While most people think primarily about Bitcoin and other virtual currencies within the context of financial innovation, FinTech has assumed a much wider perspective. It is important to understand that the term FinTech is not confined to specific sectors such as financing or business models such as P2P lending. Rather, the term FinTech covers the entire scope of services and products traditionally provided by the financial services industry, and this is something that we're taking a very close look at. Seeking to remain technologically neutral, the Centre has developed a strategic program in fintech to better understand not only the risks, but the opportunities innovative financial technologies may present to the effective functioning of the Centre, as well as the regime at large. Our strategic approach to fintech is informed by in-depth research and environmental scanning activities, and undertaking activities like this where we reach out to other partners to help us identify specific trends related, uh, sorry, of most relevance for operations. While fintech innovations have provided consumers with great new options for financial service delivery, like Gabe mentioned, just because you own Bitcoin, it doesn't mean that you're a terrorist or a criminal. There's great uses for these technologies. They also have provided bad actors with new options to raise and launder funds for illicit pur purposes. And while the fintech environment is both diverse and complex, we have noticed that many of the technologies that are uh, used present common characteristics that can be exploited for abuse. For instance, many of these systems offer a degree of anonymity. They can be accessed globally and can allow for the transfer of funds across borders quickly. These characteristics have challenged tr uh, traditional approaches to financial regulation and monitoring as the technologies exist in an increasingly borderless ecosystem. Whether and how the entities employing these technologies are ascertaining user identity, particularly in non-face-to-face -face environments, is also a concern. As I mentioned, obfuscating identity is often at the, the core root of money laundering and terrorist finding activities, and at, as well as at anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing activities. But of course, certain financial technologies display more inherent vulnerabilities to criminal abuse than others. For instance, we know that virtual currencies have emerged as key enablers of cybercrime and have been exploited at all stages of cybercrime activity. It is well established that virtual currencies are the primary payment mechanisms across dark web, dark web networks and associated dark web hidden services, which offer access to an array of illicit goods and services, such as um, the examples include the now defunct Silk Road and more recently Alpha Bay. Both Aaron and Gabe spoke, spoke to those developments. Virtual currencies have also been used to obtain funds from victims of cybercrime, like Aaron mentioned, specifically from ransomware, and have sub subsequently sorry, been used to launder the proceeds of these crimes. But the virtual currency ecosystem is large and diverse, and as both Gabriel and Aaron described earlier, the decentralized and convertible nature of cryptocurrencies in particular have rendered them vulnerable to abuse for money laundering and terrorist financing purposes to a greater extent than other virtual currencies. This is largely due to their ability to allow direct peer-to-peer -peer transactions outside of the traditional regulated financial system, their ability to provide users with a certain degree of anonymity, and their relative technical complexity. Cryptocurrencies have thus remained a primary concern to FinTrack and to our Canadian regime partners and to FIUs internationally. Of course, this brings us to Bitcoin, the first and most well-known cryptocurrency. The concept of Bitcoin was first introduced in a white paper released in 2008 by an individual or a group of individuals, we're not sure, operating the, under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. The technology described in this white paper was subsequently released as open source software in 2009. This technology is thus incredibly nascent, so we don't really know what the potential and impact of cryptocurrencies will be on the uh, traditional financial system or on, on typical use of, of financial products and services. Even still, over the past several years, Bitcoin use and popularity has increased significantly. Despite extreme price volatility, current Bitcoin market capitalization has surpassed 27 billion Canadian dollars. Using Bitcoin has also become easier for average users, with the development of a robust cryptocurrency infrastructure and service providers, facilitating basic use and storage, as well as Bitcoin to fiat currency exchange. These developments suggest that it is reasonable to believe that Bitcoin uptake will increase over time. While there are many legal uses for Bitcoin, it has become infamous for its association with illegal activities, particularly online. We know that there is an established connection between Bitcoin and fraud, 
money laundering, terrorist financing, the sale of narcotics and other illicit goods and services via darknet markets, human trafficking, ransomware, and online uh, child sexual exploitation. The reputation of Bitcoin as a key enabler of cybercrime has become somewhat prolific, with Europol estimating that more than 40% of illegal online transactions are currently conducted using the cryptocurrency. So how does Bitcoin work? Running largely parallel to the traditional financial system, Bitcoin's decentralized structure relies on cryptography to ensure trust in an essentially trustless environment. While we'll leave the technical descri description of the technology to computer scientists in the room, like Jeremy, Bitcoin can be simply understood as, a, as relying on a shared distributed ledger that is publicly viewable and maintained by members of the Bitcoin network, which in theory, anyone can become a part of. Rather than representing anything tangible, a Bitcoin is essentially a declaration of ownership recorded on the blockchain, uh, blockchain distributed ledger available for the world to see. Transactions, which are decla declarations of ownership, are broadcast to a network of computers owned by participants in the network and known as nodes, which then perform mathematical calculations to confirm the that the transaction is consistent with the records of ownership that have already been recorded on their copy of the shared distributed ledger. When the majority of computers have agreed that a transaction is valid, the transaction is included in a block of other transactions. This new block contains information referencing the block that preceded it, which creates an immutable and transparent record of transactions in the form of a blockchain. This ultimately functions to create a system that is secure in that it is protected through cryptography, resilient in that it lacks a central point of failure, transparent in that all information is visible on the blockchain, fast in that transactions are processed in mere minutes outside of the traditional financial system, and low cost through eliminating the need for intermediaries. Thus, as a permanent ledger of all Bitcoin transactions ever conducted, the, the blockchain allows for the observation of the entire transaction history and holding of every Bitcoin user. Of course, participants in the, any financial system would expect a certain degree of privacy with regards to their financial activity and account holdings. In the case of Bitcoin, financial privacy is maintained through the use of unique and randomly generated public and private key pairs assigned to users and unique cryptocurrency addresses assigned to each unique transaction. The public can simply access the information recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain using a variety of blockchain explorers available on the surface web, such as blockchain.info, which I have presented here on the screen. A blockchain explorer is a web application that operates as a, as a Bitcoin search engine. So it allows you to search for addresses, transactions, and blocks, and see the relationship and flows between them. So the inf information recorded on a blockchain is not human readable in that we may not necessarily understand what is recorded in the jumbled string of numbers and letters. Users do leave behind various data that can be used to link a transaction or a series of transactions to a particular individual, particularly where the individual is not careful to obscure their identity, which we'll get to later. However, it's important to note that this isn't easy. It requires a trained, uh, trained eye and trained professionals and often advanced software to accurately interpret the information that is publicly av available. For example, it's not reasonable to assume that the transaction displayed here, and this is a real transaction, by the way, um, originated from the location displayed on the screen. Rather, this should be understood as the location of the node relaying the transaction information. Thus, despite being promoted as an anonymous virtual currency by several media outlets, Bitcoin is regarded as pseudonymous as, at best. So both Gabe and Aaron have spoke to that. In order to protect the financial privacy of users, a host of anon anonymization services have emerged across the cryptocurrency ecosystem in an effort to obscure the relationship between activities recorded on a blockchain and the individuals responsible for each activity. While there are legitimate reasons why individuals may choose to employ transaction anonymizers, Many of these tools have been largely associated with financial crime. Many of these services, including BitLaunder and Dark Wallet, for example, have been created and promoted for the express purpose of money laundering. The various techniques employed to obscure user identity on the Bitcoin blockchain include engaging in off-chain transactions, using services created specifically to mask the origin of funds, or using the privacy, or sorry, or using privacy-centric Bitcoin alternatives which are referred to as altcoins to better mask one's transaction trail. So I'll speak to each of these in turn. Many of the greatest systemic vulnerabilities to money laundering and terrorist financing across the Bitcoin ecosystem 
are associated with so-called off-chain activities and entities. Examples include intermediaries and services such as cryptocurrency gambling sites and exchanges that operate outside of the Bitcoin protocol, protocol and are managed by their own internal accounting records. So for example, cryptocurrency exchanges perform buy and sell operations off-chain via their own private databases. Similar challenges are posed by the physical exchange of cryptocurrency addresses during in-person meetups, which are often facilitated by online platforms such as localbitcoins.com. Existing outside of the blockchain network, transactions supported by these services are not recorded on the distributed ledger. In such cases, movements of funds to and from these services would be viewable on the blockchain, but any transactions internal to these services would not be recorded. While many of these emerging services have implemented client identification measures or have assisted law enforcement investigations, others have been overtly associated with fraud, theft, money laundering, and other criminal acts. So here I've included an example of localbitcoins.com where people can go online and see where people have, uh, are, are offering to sell Bitcoin or to exchange uh, via in-person meetups. Um, it can also be, these purchases can be made in cash or they could be made via other mechanisms. Alternative techniques to further obscure user identity across the Bitcoin blockchain include the use of mixers and tumblers. Both Aaron and Gabriel refer to those in their presentations. I'll, I'll give you a quick automation to give you a bit of a, a visual of what it looks like and then I'll, I'll describe. These services are used to break the connection between the addresses sending and receiving coins to the service before sending value back to users. While the capacity to offer full user anonymity varies across these services, the demonstrated success of several mixers to do so raises serious concern from, from an anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing perspective. Used skillfully, these services have the capacity to facilitate complex layering schemes, distancing illicit transactions from their source of origin. For instance, a Russian academic study released last year identified a case where a Bitcoin mixer was used to create 98 layers of transactions. It is likely that the use of cryptocurrency mixers and other an anonymization tools will become more prevalent over time or will otherwise be incorporated into the underlying protocols of emerging cryptocurrencies. Aaron referred to this earlier. New Bitcoin alternatives commonly referred to as altcoins, which I believe there are about more than 700 now in circulation, um, including Dash and Monero, have already integrated this feature, ensuring that every transaction is pre-mixed and thereby providing greater user anonymity across the respective blockchain networks. Zcash is another example, a cryptocurrency that was introduced in October 2016, promising full user anonymity by encrypting transaction metadata rather than making it publicly available, as in the case of the Bitcoin blockchain. So while this session was about Bitcoin, um, delivering the FinTrack perspective has dem demanded a discussion of a much wider group of technologies and virtual currencies. So I hope that you appreciate that. And as, as I've indicated on the slide, Zcash did have academic origins. So it's very much helpful for us to come to venues like this, cell, but like this one and to uh, build on the, the expertise and experience in this room. Thank you very much, everyone.